Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, what part of the world, and welcome to this uh, webinar, um, uh, Evidence-Based Practice uh, During the COVID-19 Pandemic, More Important Than Ever. So this webinar is delivered by the FIP uh, Pharmacy Practice Research Special Interest Group, and it's delivered in collaboration with the journal Research in Social and Administrative Pharmacy, and also the social um, um, and, um, sorry, an administrative pharmacy section of FIP. So just to introduce myself, I will be the moderator for the webinar. Uh, my name is Victoria Garcia Cardenas, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney. And I'm also the chair of the FIP Pharmacy Practice uh, Special Interest Group. And I'm also an associate editor of uh, research in social and administrative pharmacy. Just to give you an overview of this uh, webinar series, uh, they provide uh, very important information uh, for pharmacies during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we hope that these webinars are um, a way of sharing and discussing strategies adopted by pharmacy leaders and workers and organizations, describe the current evidence, uh, consider the impact of the disease on patients across different uh, age groups and assess and discuss the uh, current evidence uh, behind the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So if you have any ideas, feel free to share them uh, with uh, Lina. You can find her email on the slide and um, yes, yeah, she will be in touch with you to organize it. A uh, few information before we start. So just to let you know, there is a FIP COVID-19 information hub. So it is a comprehensive uh, website that contains all links and resources uh, regarding COVID-19. So you including recordings to this webinar and previous webinars. So you can find the website on this slide. And there is also an FIP Facebook group, which is called COVID-19 and Pharmacy. And you can also find the link on this slide. Before we start, uh, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. And the recording uh, will be available on the FIP website. Uh, you can ask questions as we go on the question and answer box. And please feel free to provide your feedback uh, on the email that is provided on this slide. We have different learning objectives for this webinar. So the first one is to differentiate the, between the different levels of evidence. Uh, our second learning objective is to identify the types of evidence that can be used to inform practice and also to critically assess uh, studies related to COVID-19 and being able to use them to inform uh, practice when appropriate. The relevance of this webinar is that evidence-based practice requires that healthcare decisions are made based on the best available, carbon, valid, and relevant evidence. So evidence-based practice is essential to deliver high-quality patient care. So as you can see, this is critical during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we will share very useful information uh, today with three speakers. So our first speaker will cover the different levels of evidence. Our second speaker will uh, cover critical appraisal of evidence. And then our third speaker will cover economic evidence to inform decision making. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Philippa Alves da Costa. Uh, Philippa is also a member of FIP and she's a public health consultant for the World Health Organization. She's also an associate professor at the IUEM and also at the University of Lisbon. So she's a researcher with uh, a lot of years of experience in many different areas. And so she's also an associate editor for the journal, International Journal of Clinical uh, Pharmacy. And she's also chair of the Education Committee of the European Society of uh, Clinical Pharmacy. So thank you very much, Philippa, for uh, being with us today. And we look forward to uh, listening to your presentation. 
Okay. Thank you, uh, Victoria, for this uh, nice presentation and introduction. And thank you all for joining our webinar. Uh, we hope we meet your expectations. Just to add to the introduction, I'm also part of the social and administrative pharmacy section of FIP. So it's a pleasure to be uh, doing this webinar jointly with the SIG Pharmacy Practice uh, Research. So um, we hope we all, you all enjoy. So let me start oops by going to my first slide sorry about that uh, okay so i'll I, I would like to start by um establishing the basis of the difference between evidence and opinion um, so sometimes we go to a pharmacy as clients as we all are occasionally ill um, and we ask the pharmacist what's the best medicine that they have on their stock for a specific uh, symptom and uh, what I really don't like to hear is oh I think based on my experience is that this is the best medicine um, my slides have their own will so I will just continue uh, so what we want to hear as customers is um, the evidence shows that the best medicine for this specific symptom is this one uh, and not that one and that is the basis of um, evidence so then we have different levels of evidence and uh, when we go to court for example they ask us to uh, provide uh, what we have observed of an accident for example on the road which we have witnessed and we should stick to facts what have we observed we shouldn't say we think this car crashed that one because uh, eventually he was on the phone so that would be opinion evidence when we move into evidence-based medicine then the higher um, the the responsibility is so we have a conscious and explicit and judicious use of the current evidence that has been published and this evidence should be used to inform our decision making pro process in practice and that's uh, what we will be focusing during the uh, this webinar so for that purpose we have this hierarchy of evidence which has been uh, used by various associations and entities everybody has surely come across it and uh, you can see this is uh, represents a pyramid the higher uh, it is on the pyramid the higher the quality the quality of the evidence is um, however this pyramid is divided into two major groups you have filtered information and unfiltered information so i'll focus mostly on unfiltered information so these are the the raw studies let's say and then the ones on the top are those that combine various of the studies on the basis of the pyramid and i will start from the basis to the top of course we will not have time to cover all of them um, so i'll just focus the most important ones uh, so on the basis we have the consensus statements um, and there are various forms of uh, consensus that ha uh, are used in pharmacy practice research uh, many tools that are available have been generated by consensus and these are very valid uh, the main point that I would like to highlight here is that um, these recommendations that are issued by um, a cons uh, an expert panel in general, they should be based on solid uh, evidence that the experts have analyzed and critically appraised. They should not come from their own experience in practice. So you have some good consensus statements and you have bad consensus statements sometimes when they come from a self-selected sample of experts just my friends and they will not be providing <laughs> the best evidence unless they are able to support their recommendations um, with good uh, quality uh, information so just as an example the who provides various recommendations but all the recommendations are based on systematic reviews um, so this is one way to use consensus statements 
Then we go to the observational studies. There are lots of observational studies. I'll highlight four of them. So the, the, the one that's the first and lowest in evidence is the case study. Uh, so normally case studies are very useful uh, when we need to understand better uh, and increase the knowledge of um, a given disease that we don't know. Um, because it provides very detailed information on the signs and symptoms um, and even eventually on some uncommon exposures. So as you can see here on the slide, this is a case presentation of a patient that was um, uh, one of the first that was identified um, as a COVID-19 um, patient. And you have descriptions of the uh, vital signs of the laboratory results and all of that. This was exactly the same that it happened on the 60s when we had the, the, the case of the birth defects that rose as an exposure to thalidomide. So the basis is exactly the same. It all started with a letter to the editor and then other physicians saw that report and started to think, oh, I saw a similar case like that. And when they then combine that information, it becomes into a case series. So what you see here on your right hand side is a case series. So um, these are simply collections of patient reports uh, and they share um, either the same effect or they have been exposed to the same substance or um, uh, external factor. Um, these are very useful when we want to explore rare diseases um, and their main limitation is the fact that they, that they do not have a, a control group. Then we go to the cross-sectional studies which are also very used in pharmacy practice research. Uh, the main characteristic of these studies is that they include large samples of individuals. They are taken um, in one moment of time they represent um, one or eventually a short period of time. And normally they're also called prevalence studies. So they're very useful, for example, if we want to measure the prevalence of a given disease in this point of time in one specific country. Uh, so they are classified as descriptive studies for large populations, but they can also be used to explore risk factors. If you do a sub-analysis within this large population, you can identify risk factors and different behaviors within the population and then use those to establish hypotheses that can be further uh, confirmed by um, more robust studies. So I provide three examples here on the, the right hand side, all related to COVID. So one is a study that was done in Malaysia where they were focusing on knowledge and attitudes on um, measures that people take to, to avoid crowds and hygiene and use of face masks. The second one is also uh, based on a self-reported study, almost 4,000 people involved. But the difference here is that they were able to explore associations between subgroups of uh, individuals. So they provide this um, information that older adults seem to have additional knowledge than younger uh, people. In the third one, it's a, a further expansion to that where they do report these associations but transformed into a risk measure. So they report the adjusted odds ratio. So here they, they are comparing UK bathers with non-bathers and they say that the bathers have uh, more frequently uh, skin um, uh, changes. And they report this as an adjusted odds ratio uh, above two. So this means that the odds is twice it's over twice higher than if people would not uh, bath. Uh, so let me take you to the con case control studies. Um, in this is the first that uh, belongs to the analytical studies. Uh, so here we always have two groups of individuals and the difference between them, you can see here on the cartoon, it's very easy to see. So on one side, you have the people who are healthy, on the other side, you have the unhealthy ones. So then you, um, as a researcher, you ask all of them, how was your previous exposure? So it's a retrospective study. 
um, and you can assess various risk factors uh, simultaneously. So in this case control study I use as reference which you can um, dig further after the webinar. They, they looked at um, cases which were defined as individuals who had a positive test uh, for COVID regardless of being symptomatic or asymptomatic and the controls were people with negative tests. Uh, in one group they had over 12,000, in the other group, in the control group, they had over 20,000. And then the exposure that they were investigating were the comorbidities. So the previous chronic conditions that individuals had before acquiring uh, COVID-19. And the main conclusion of this study is that obesity um, is a major risk factor for um, COVID-19 um, severe outcomes. So passing on to the cohort studies, the main difference with these studies, again, they have two groups of individuals. They have uh, the exposed individuals and the unexposed individuals. And then these individuals are followed prospectively throughout time. Um, this uh, exposure is purely accidental. So the researcher has no control on the exposure. Um, and this can take six months, 20 years, as you see on the slide, eventually the researcher will have died when the study has been finished. This is a possibility. And then the, um, the, the conclusions are also uh, reported as uh, risks, uh, but different types of risks. So in this case, relative risks or hazard ratios. So again, I provide you um, an example of a study that's a cohort study that was conducted in the context of COVID-19. What they have done is that they uh, compared people exposed to COVID-19 with people exposed to H1N1, and then they looked at the clinical manifestations, uh, imaging characteristics, treatments, and prognosis of both groups. Um, so the, the, the main conclusions here were that um, uh, in the case of COVID-19, more often um, they, the, there were uh, non-productive coughs involved. And in the case of H1N1, um, more frequently there was sequential organ failure. Um, the in-hospital mortality group was not significantly different across both groups compared, so they could not draw any valid conclusions from that. So, Finally, we go to the um, clinical trials, which basically uh, work ex exactly the same way as the cohort studies. The main difference is that there is a researcher who controls the exposure. So people do not uh, expose themselves accidentally. They volunteer to become part of a trial. Um, this is I mean, uh, used most frequently to test new drugs that are coming up on the market. And here um, you can see uh, a table that's taken from the WHO website where you can see that nearly 2,000 studies are currently ongoing worldwide to evaluate um, potential treatments or preventions for COVID-19. Um, So this is it for the uh, unfiltered um, information. Then we go to the uh, filtered information. So I'll ve very briefly just touch upon two main types of studies, systematic reviews. So what you do here is that you need to have a very good research question that's uh, well established. What is the population that's being studied? What's the intervention? What's the control? what's the outcome that's being measured. So normally you use three or more databases to run the search and um, ideally you should include um, studies that are similar, similar in terms of evidence provided and in terms of design. Um, Fernanda will go deeper into this because then you'd need to critically appraise them and to evaluate the risk of bias and you can present 
the results either narratively or in a tabular form. So when it is uh, possible to combine these results, uh, you get um, a meta-analysis. So um, the basic difference of a meta-analysis is that um, you are uh, it is possible to translate the results into a risk ratio. So in, in this study I'm showing, uh, they are comparing uh, the risks of um, uh, within person transmission of COVID if you wear a face mask, if you wear eye protection, or if you um, have uh, different distances so physical distance to other people. So uh, shorter than one meter or um, longer than one meter. And the main result is what we already know is that you should wear a face mask, you should wear eye protection and you should increase physical distance. Of course, the quality of the evidence is not the same. So the only one that has been considered as having uh, moderate evidence is the physical distance. The other one still have um, low evidence. So I'll just pass to my last slide to and to transmit the main take home message. I think all studies have their place as long as they're well conducted and this uh, image on your right shows you exactly that. Um, it doesn't mean that if you have a systematic review we will have the best study on earth or if you have a case study it's the worst study. If it's badly conducted you will revert the pyramid to the um, opposite to what's expected. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Filipa, uh, for that uh, informative presentation and for providing an overview of the different levels of evidence and how they can uh, inform practice. So now um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our second speaker. Uh, who is Fernanda Tanin. Uh, Fernanda is a hair consultant and she's also a researcher at the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. Uh, Fernanda is also the vice chair of the FIP Pharmacy Practice Research SIC and she's also a member of the editorial board of Pharmacy Practice. So thank you Fernanda for uh, being with us today and we are looking forward to listening to your presentation. Thank you, Victoria, for your kind introduction and greetings everyone that are following us in another of our webinars. It's a pleasure to be here and to share this event with recognized name in the field like professors Victoria, Filipa and Dalia. So continuing with the points raised by Professor Filipa, today I will address uh, the critical appraisal of evidence, how to effectively practice as an evidence-based practice provider. So we already saw that the hierarchy of evidence is important for decision-making process. However, we are daily surrounded by the hundreds of uh, publications and information from different sources, and it's difficult to keep up to date with the best evidence. And we already know that suboptimal research is common around the world. So 27% of publications are redundant or unnecessary. Another 20% have methodological flaws beyond repair. 20% are not published and one part, although being published, they are not useful and around 15% lead to misleading conclusions. So what we have left is that only 3% of all scientific research has a clinical and scientific meaning. That's why critical appraisal of evidence is really important, more, and not, more now than ever in the COVID area, to increase the value of research and reduce the waste. In a simple search in PubMed with the descriptors of COVID-19 and the year of 2020, we can find more than 25,000 publications on this topic just in the past five or six months. So uh, as researchers and healthcare providers, we should be able to know where to find information to identify, select, evaluate the best and most up-to-date evidence and to integrate these findings with the clinical experiences and patients' values. So currently, several electronic sources are, av are available for searching COVID-19 data. 
we are uh, we already know uh, data uh, databases like PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science. But I want to to remind that now we have also COVID evidence that is a database provided by the University of Basel in Switzerland that aims to provide a planet ongoing and completed trials on any intervention to treat or provide SARS-CoV-2 infections. Besides this database, we can also find information on some centers like the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine from the University of Oxford and also in the Cochrane Collaboration website. So critical appraisal is defined as the process of systematically assessing the outcome of scientific research to judge its trustworthiness, value, and relevance in each scenario. It aims to evaluate the level and quality of evidence and to support the decision-making process. So at the end, we should be able to respond as how certain are we about the results, so the validity of this data, and how applicable are these results to practice. So critical appraisal is essential to combat information over information overload that we can see now in the COVID-19 era, identify papers that are clinically relevant and to help continue profession development. For carrying out critical appraisal, some basic steps are needed. So uh, as professionals, we need to carefully read the studies to define the study design, that is to say, do it, to evaluate research methods, as already pointed out by Professor Filippa, and to validate or check the minimum, if minimum standards are met by those studies of conduction and reporting. So for this, we can use checklists and statements, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And finally, it's important to address the quality and validity of these results, and we can do that by grading the evidence, and compare this data with other studies. So for conducting and reporting studies, it's important to use overall recommendations that are uh, usually available by the Equator Network. The Equator Network is an international initiative that aims to improve the reliability and value of public healthcare research literature in a transparent and accurate way. So what they do is to uh, provide a wider use of robust guidelines for reporting and conducting studies. Uh, many of you must be familiar with the consort guideline that is used for randomized control trials or even the strobe for observational studies and the prisma for systematic reviews or even the cheers for economic evaluations that will be better explained by Dahlia later. So what's important here is that we should be able to identify this checklist or statements and use them to evaluate the research in both synthesis, in both in, both in synthesis and uh, in final evaluations. So besides the evaluation of the studies, it's important to ask some questions when we are carefully reading the studies. So is the evidence from a known and reportable sources? It was published in a scientific paper. If so, in which journal? Has the evidence been evaluated or graded in any way? How up-to-date is the evidence that we are reading? Were all important outcomes considered and how were they measured? For instance, for COVID-19 treatment, it's important to use uh, outcomes such as disease cure or length of hospital stay or even mortality. How large was the effect size? So as Filippa uh, told us, effect size is a quantitative measure of magnitude of effect of a comparison. So the larger the effect size, the higher the association between two variables. And finally, what implications does the study have for our practice? Is it relevant? Can the results be applied to practice? And are this the benefits worth the costs and potential risks? For these last three questions, it's always important to consider both uh, clinical, humanistic, and economic uh, outcomes. So one important discussion since the beginning of the pandemic that yielded uh, many conflicting results was the use of hydroxychloroquine for treat COVID-19 patients. These discussions highlighted the, how evidence-based practice is paramount for healthcare decisions. So two, late, uh, two studies published in June and July of this year as a critical appraisal and a systematic review finally demonstrate that this drug has no further benefits 
for treat COVID-19 patients and also may cause some side effects and cardiotoxicity. So this uh, critical appraisal and systematic review and meta-analysis were done by gathering the primary studies. And here we can have a robust results about uh, the, for using or not this drug. Besides the discussion on uh, hydroxychloroquine, we also have a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analysis evaluating other drugs, so antiviral treatments for COVID-19, that also show no further benefits still for these drugs. We can also find systematic reviews and meta-analysis evaluating the, the performance of diagnosis tests for COVID-19. So in this case, we already know that PCR is the gold standard, but we can also find that a combination of different tests can be used, especially in low-income countries. Also, as Philippa pointed out, uh, as we don't have still a uh, treatment, an effective treatment for COVID-19, we can use um, preventive measures as physical distance, face mask, and eye protections. And finally, uh, besides the conventional meta-analysis, so the comparison of two treatments at a time, further methodological approach, such as network meta-analysis, are already emerging in the context of this pandemic. So for you, there are, for, for those that are not familiar with, network meta-analysis, also called indirect meta-analysis or multiple treatment comparisons, are an extension of pairwise meta-analysis. And with this technique, we can combine both direct evidence, that is to say that one available in literature, with indirect evidence that is estimated by a common comparator. As in this slide B, the intervention B could be the common comparator between A and C. With this, we can have uh, the analysis comparing all interventions and network meta-analysis also allow us to rank these interventions in the best, second best, and so on, according to the data on the comparative analysis. Currently, we have found only one published network meta-analysis on COVID-19 that evaluate the effects of four types of integrated Chinese and Western medicine for treating the disease in China. The, work, the network meta-analysis uh, constructed by the author found a slightly difference on the use of a specific granular intervention and this slide uh, as intervention D uh, that but still further evidence is needed to confirm this data so what we can say from here is we still lack on network meta-analysis for COVID-19 because few clinical trials and hobos primary studies have been performed so far However, this scenario may completely change in the near future, so we must be prepared to deal with all this information. So finally, it's important to grade the available evidence on a given topic. For this, we can use the great approach that provides a transparent and structured way to make judgments about the certainty of the evidence and offers uh, also a process for making recommendations and decisions. The great approach is currently used by more over 100 organizations globally, including the World Health Organization. Ideally, this approach is applied to rate the certainty of a body of evidence in a well-conducted and up-to-date evidence synthesis, providing us several summary tables. So this approach can be used and is important for making decisions and recommendations. So uh, with the grade, we can grade evidence as high, moderate, low, or very low, according to how, uh, depending on how future evidence may change or may not change the current results that we have now. And for assess this evidence, we use some domains from the study. So we, we assess the study design, so if the study was randomized control trial or observational studies, the quality of this evidence that is assessed by using risk of bias tools, uh, the inconsistencies that refers to data heterogeneity, indirectness that refers on how the patients or the populations and outcomes on these studies met our research question, and imprecision that refers to the extension of the um, effect size data. 
So by according to some criteria, these domains if they can be upgraded or upgraded or downgraded to finally obtain a score of the quality of the evidence. And this score may guide the formulation of recommendations that can be usually expressed as strong or weak and in favor and against and prevention. So, so for instance, we can now say that we have potentially strong evidence against the use of hydroxychloroquine for treating COVID-19 patients. So uh, taking into account that GRADE is a complex approach that takes time and uh, careful evaluation, Schoenemann recently published how to use GRADE in some different situations. So the author states that in situations of emergencies and urgency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, GRADE can simply be used to express uh, the evidence, the grade, the evidence. So for this, the authors uh, express, um, exemplify critical appraisal during the pandemic using this flowchart. So we can see here that for emergency or ultra short time response that needed within hours, we can use rapid evaluations of evidence from previous studies. In this case, from previous studies on coronavirus outbreaks. And for instance, we would be able to answer if uh, nine N95 versus surgical masks can be used for the COVID pandemic. For urgent response needed in one to two weeks, we can already use urgent or complete systematic reviews. For answers, for instance, if non-invasive versus invasive mechanical ventilations could be used. Rapid response referred to response up to three months. In these cases, rapid reviews and recommendations can already be done by accumulating the evidence. And finally, for routine response, we can use questions allowed during this assessment of evidence and living approaches. To end this part, I have some implications and take home message on how to effectively practice as an evidence-based practice provider. So we should get used to always evaluate the provenance and quality of information. Critical appraisal looks at the way a study is conducted and evaluate factors such as internal validity, generalizability, and relevance. Evidence and recommendation generations need high quality studies, so data confidence, and we still don't have these high quality studies for COVID-19. Decisions related to patient value and care are carefully made following an essential process of integrating the best evidence with clinical experiences and patient practice preferences. And finally, grading the certainty of the available evidence is more important now than ever because of the unprecedented pressure of for action and the large number of people affected by our decisions. So thank you very much. I hope we expand your expectations. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Definitely, uh, I think you cover an overview of critical appraisal and how it can inform uh, practice and how important it is, because as Philippa mentioned, it can invert the pyramid of evidence. So thank you very much for that. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to our third speaker, Dalia Dawood. Um, she, uh, Dalia is an associate editor for research in social and administrative pharmacy, and also for value in health, uh, two very important uh, journals. And she's also an associate professor um, in the Faculty of Pharmacy at Cairo University in Egypt. So thank you very much, Dalia, uh, for being with us today, and we look forward to uh, listening to your presentation. Thank you so much, Victoria, for the introduction. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, my screen quickly. Okay, so as we have heard from both Philippa uh, and Fernanda uh, about the clinical evidence and how important it is at the moment, uh, we are really in a dire situation that we are inundated with information that we need to make sense of and base recommendations on. But the, these are not the only actually information. It's not only the clinical evidence that we have to be uh, um, aware of and take into account when we make decisions. It's also 
the economic evidence. And this is a, the missing piece of this jigsaw puzzle that I want to concentrate on in this presentation. And why is this important? It's because that all our healthcare systems now across the world are collapsing because of the pressure caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's no healthcare system in the world in general that can provide every intervention or every effective intervention for their population. Because simply resources are limited and our wants and needs are limitless. And I think this concept of scarcity clearly has been exemplified in what we are seeing at the moment. So we are becoming that very familiar with this curve about flat or the, the, this uh, diagram on flattening the curve. Why do we need that to bring um, uh, the, the pressure on the healthcare system under control and to be within healthcare system capacity? And what capacity is actually is the resources that we have, so staffing, ventilation, ventilator, uh, hospital beds, treatments. So all these now, all these resources are now coming under pressure because of this pandemic. And we have to be aware that any decision that we make to invest or to put money or divert our resources to one direction means that we are unable to use it in another direction. So there is an opportunity cost as economists put it for any decision that you make to fund treatments or interventions for a particular um, disease area. And by diverting all our resources now to COVID-19 treatments, we are actually starting to see the opportunity cost and having to make choices and uh, focusing on COVID-19 treatments. We are making trade-offs and reports are coming that we are seeing more cancer deaths, for example, due to delays in treatment because of this diversion of resources. So how can decision makers work with, uh, under the under um, these circumstances and decide which interventions they, they should fund. This is usually done by using health economic analysis techniques and essentially utilizing economic analysis methods to inform decision making regarding the allocation of these scarce resources by identifying interventions that are most likely to provide the best value for money. And which are cost-effective uh, interventions, basically. And I would argue these decisions are now more important than ever because we really need to be very careful about the resource allocation in this time. And one of the most commonly used uh, economic analysis techniques uh, that, are, that are specifically used for informing decision-making regarding resource allocation is the economic evaluation. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with economic evaluation, it's essentially a comparative analysis. You are comparing two or, uh, two or more alternative courses of action or treatments or interventions or treatment pathways and comparing both their costs and their uh, health outcomes or their consequences. So, in, in that sense, you are essentially taking both the costs and resource use aspect as well as the health outcomes in the same uh, analysis. And there are different types of economic evaluations quickly to cover them. They are largely determined by the nature and the measure of the outcomes. So for all of them, costs is the common uh, aspect, but the difference in how we measure the outcomes, how we express them, uh, and whether there is evidence or assumptions to say that there is equivalence the, between these interventions or not, as well as how the analysis results are presented, whether we present costs and outcomes uh, next to each other or we focus on uh, or we combine them to give a measure of cost effectiveness is what determines the type of an economic evaluation. And economic evaluations, essentially, to identify them, you need to answer two questions as yes. So you are, are you comparing both costs and consequences of your interventions and do you have more and two or more comparators. So in, in that sense, for this, uh, these are what we call full economic evaluations. However, in this current situation, I would argue that we need all types of these studies, even partial economic evaluations, in order to inform our decisions because we are in an, in an evidence-free space, basically. So even cost description, studies of resource use, all these would be informative in building on and, um, uh, and making decisions afterwards in, in when we combine them in a full economic evaluation. The, the different types are, uh, quickly are cost consequences analysis where you present both costs and outcomes separately um, and uh, you report more than one outcome. So you are focusing on a number of outcomes and presenting these uh, to uh, decision makers to make their uh, decisions based on both of them. In cost effectiveness analysis, you are focusing on one primary outcome, which is usually measured in terms of natural health units. So for example, number of strokes avoided. And this is usually useful for decisions within single disease areas. Moving from that to a cost utility analysis, this is a type of analysis that uses a primary outcome, but it's a generic outcome, an outcome that can be measured across disease areas. For, for example, the quality adjusted life years or qualities, which combine both the effect of the interventions on um, uh, quality of life as well as survival. Uh, so, length of life and quality of life. 
uh, and there are other units like the DALIs. Cost-benefit analysis, uh, which is a final type of these uh, four types of economic evaluation, is measures both um, benefits and costs in monetary terms. So essentially translating the out health outcomes into monetary terms. And this is why it is uh, uh, less used within healthcare because it's not usually acceptable mainly by clinicians to both value on, uh, on health, on life, basically. Uh, but essentially you are measuring both benefits and costs in monetary terms and seeing whether you achieve a positive net monetary benefit. When do we do an economic evaluation? Usually economic evaluations are most useful after three types of studies, or they can be done alongside these studies, but essentially you need to ascertain efficacy for efficacy studies, first of all, can the intervention work? Is it safe? Does it do more good than harm? And does it work when it's used in practice? So real world uh, studies that look at the effectiveness under real conditions rather than clinical trials. Usually the bottom line is that if an intervention is not effective, it's not cost effective. It's not a sensible use of resources. So we are seeing more and more evidence that, for example, that hydroxychloroquine is not effective as we have seen from the studies. And, and, and still, some countries are providing it. And this is a clear like waste of resources if we know that this is not effective. And even some safety studies showed some increase in, in, um, uh, in uh, side effects as well. So these need to be considered when we decide on whether an intervention is cost effective. And there are two ab main approaches where you can collect data for useful for you or conduct an economic evaluation. Essentially, you can conduct it within the frame of a, a, a clinical study. So you can do it alongside a clinical study where you collect also data on costs and outcomes simultaneously. And these are mainly phase three RCTs. But you can also use mathematical modeling where you can combine uh, the costs and consequences of a large number of uh, interventions and draw on all the available uh, information that you have from epidemiology studies, uh, also observational studies and RCTs. So you have a larger pool for the information that you can use in, in a mathematical or an economic modeling uh, framework. And usually models are used to extrapolate beyond the clinical trial follow-up because the studies, the clinical studies are usually short in their uh, follow-up. Uh, so, the, mainly the, or broadly, the main steps when you conduct a full economic evaluation is that you need to ascertain and measure, identify and measure and value the, the outcomes and the costs. Then you combine the costs and outcomes in a measure of, of cost effectiveness. And you can also assess the uncertainty when you draw conclusions about uh, uh, your final conclusion about cost effectiveness. And this is very useful for decision makers because they can know the amount of decision uncertainty in, in the final decision. And also, potentially, you could also conduct value of information analysis. And this is useful to inform future research uh, investment. So whether is it right to, take, to make a decision right now based on the information that we have, or is it more uh, sensible to invest in collecting more information to gain more understanding and certainty, and certainty about our decisions? And similar to clinical evidence, you need to critically appraise, you need to assess methodological quality and the applicability of your studies to your population. Some of the simple tools that are available is a, a CUSP tool, which looks, which has a checklist that prompts reviewers to answer some specific questions about whether the economic evaluation is valid, how were the costs and consequences assessed and compared, and whether the results actually help in actual decision uh, for, for providing interventions to your population, your actual population that you are making uh, the decisions for. Uh, but also we have, uh, in addition to these checklists, we also have guidelines for conducting pharmacoeconomic evaluation or economic evaluations. That is available, for example, from um, uh, ESPOR website. Uh, and these guidelines uh, give what, what we call in some jurisdictions reference cases, where it gives guidance of what are the set of methodological standards that researchers have to adhere to in order to uh, to uh, assess the, uh, in order to ensure that their studies are actually applicable in this particular jurisdiction. For example, um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence uh, in the UK has its, uh, its own methods guide that lists what is the reference case for the UK based economic evaluations. But also we have reporting standards. So for, for um, journals, for peer reviewers and editors in order to be able to uh, assess, uh, the, the, uh, not assess, but ensure that the uh, economic evaluations have covered all the essential elements for reporting, cl clarity of reporting uh, of an economic evaluation to allow it to be re replicated, for example, by other researchers for everyone reading it to understand exactly what was done when 
and to, to whom, um, and all the elements of, the, uh, of an economic evaluation have been covered or detailed in the study. And this essentially, eventually, will improve the conduct of the study, although it's a reporting standard it does uh, end up improving actual, the actual conduct of the studies. And in the context of the economic evidence within uh, COVID-19 uh, research, I still see that, this, that we are still missing this piece. So uh, no e economic evaluation uh, of COVID-19 related interventions or strategies have been published uh, in peer reviewed journals so far. But we have seen only one report uh, from USA uh, in Institute, for, in Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, which used the economic modeling and a cost utility analysis economic evaluation approach in order to decide what is the value-based price benchmark for remdesivir. Uh, so this was an economic evaluation in action, basically informing decisions on pricing and their results actually informed the, 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 the eventual pricing that, uh, decision that was made by, by Gilead. However, there are a number of identified economic evaluations already published in the literature that focused on a large number of mitigation strategies that we could learn from, from the H1N1 pandemic uh, specifically. So a lot of uh, economic evaluation cover all of, of these strategies, screening, disease surveillance, even face masks, social distancing, use of antiviral for prophylaxis or treatment, vaccination, border control, school closure. So we need to be able to understand how they compare in terms of their cost effectiveness uh, as well as their effectiveness, basically. So for example, the study on, on, on face masks reported that huge cost saving could be achieved even from 10% adherence to wearing uh, uh, face masks. So there is information out there that we can draw on, but it's about finding this information as uh, Fernanda have covered, that we need to know where to look for this information. But more importantly, we need to understand how the, the studies are conducted, how to critically appraise them. But the problem is that do we expect clinicians who are working on the front line at the moment to have the time, ability, and uh, uh, essentially the, the power to do this and find evidence to inform uh, their practice? They are actually collapsing from exhaustion as the virus spreads all over the world. So uh, this comes to how we can identify the evidence and whether we should be focusing only on the evidence-based practice on the individual level. So evidence-based practice essentially focuses on teaching clinicians how to find the evidence in order to answer clinical questions. So it's focused on the clinician in a bottom-up approach. But there is also the possibility or, or, or the role of clinical guidelines and health technology assessment organizations in doing that. And they have all the experience in terms of how to find a base and, and uh, based recommendation on this evidence. And this is, takes a top-down approach. So the national organizations take, take charge in that case. So clinical guidelines are essentially statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient outcomes. And it uses all the techniques that we have covered in terms of systematically reviewing the evidence, looking for uh, evidence on benefits, harms, as well some of, of the guideline developers also include costs and resource use, and compare alternative courses of action in order to uh, come to a decision. And for example, uh, uh, many organizations you can find through the guidelines international network who work on or produce guidelines on uh, on COVID-19. World Health Organization already produced clinical guideline on COVID-19 and also the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence or NICE in the UK have produced a number actually of rapid guidelines and this is how the how, how this pandemic has evolved and changed how we do things. These usually guidelines produced by NICE would take up to two years to produce and these guidelines essentially since March uh, NICE have produced more than 20 rabbit guidelines that are focused recommendations to clinicians on the best uh, practice uh, and also the produced evidence summaries so looking at specific interventions and reviewing the evidence for these and providing uh, essentially uh, guide, guidance in terms of what is the information out there on these uh, interventions. We also have health technology assessment organizations. So it, the health technology assessment usually assess the clinical and cost effectiveness and also other aspects of value. What is of value to, to the population? So this is a multidisciplinary process that uses specific methods in order to inform decision making. So uh, organizations such as ECOG in Germany or CADIS, CADIS have been very active as well in producing some reports and systematic reviews to inform practice. So, that there, there is this true for the national organizations, but we have to appreciate that we are all practicing under uncertainty and we have to give ourselves this, this uh, uh, comforting thought that it, we are practicing with an evolving 
evidence base. We have to manage this uncertainty. And these symbol rules, five symbol rules from Rotter et al., which was published in the BMG, I would definitely recommend it for you to have a look at and how, how to make sense of these, uh, of these um, studies and uh, of this evidence. And, and the bottom line is really even guidelines that are out there. They are subject to clinical judgment because clinicians are dealing with individual patients. They are not dealing with an average patient. So I'd leave you with this thought. So demand evidence, but also think critically. Um, and I, I hope um, that sums up uh, what, what we wanted to show in this uh, uh, webinar on evidence-based practice and how important it is at this stage. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Dalia. It's always really interesting to understand how um, economic evidence can um, inform decision making. And I also found it uh, surprising that there are no COVID-19 published studies on interventions and strategies. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, thank you to our three panelists. I I think we have a couple of minutes for a couple of uh, questions, uh, which I've seen in the chat box. So uh, there is one question, I don't know who wants to answer it, about um, the meta-analysis related to hydroxychloroquine treatment made by The Lancet and why it was cancelled. So uh, I will, yeah, Fernanda, do yes. you want to go? Yeah. No, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think the Lancet article that was retreated was a multinational register, not a meta-analysis. So it was a primary study that was cancelled, that was retreated in the Lancet. The Lancet publication uh, publi uh, published a meta-analysis, but was that one that we show it, on the physical distance and face mask using, but not on hydroxychloroquine, as far as I know. Thank you very much. And a second question, has evidence-based information failed to prevent the use of drugs like hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19 prevention, as the drug is still continue to be used in some countries? I guess this is what I, what I flagged in my presentation is just the evidence is showing that it's not effective, but there are anecdotal evidence in some countries that it is and clinicians want to continue using it in addition to the misinformation that is going around and the publicity around it without any backing evidence that is taking over what is the evidence phase actually. And this is the risk is, is actually we are we are losing resources that could be used better in other in other areas by actually continuing to use uh, intervention that have been proven to be effective. So um, I'd imagine this is yeah evidence based practices kind of need to take a more um, more prominent role in in this pandemic. From now on, I see, I guess I guess the, the first few months were a panic and, and nobody knows how to proceed. But now the evidence base is starting to be there. We should be able to use it. Thank you very much. Sorry, if I could just add, not specifically for medication, but also for uh, some other preventive measures. Evidence-based is, of course, the, 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 the core for any decision. But there is another issue, which is the availability. That is not, uh, unfortunately, the same all over the world. So in some countries, for example, it is not as easy uh, to get face masks or to be able to pay for them uh, if you're regular citizens, whereas in others you, you get them for free. And this is, of course, an issue which in some cases uh, goes against the evidence and prevents uh, practitioners from using better the evidence that there, there exists already. Thank you very much. So I think that is all the time uh, we had for questions, unfortunately. So just a reminder that uh, you can register for virtual the virtual event that uh, FIP will hold uh, in September. So you have the link on the website and we hope to see you there. So thank you very much again for your participation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion and uh, 
our three presenters. And um, thank you all for your participation. <laughs> bye. Thank you. thank you. Bye.